You've been shot? No, I've not been shot. I've been, uh, You've been... I've been hit in the face. I've been really sick. Um, but that's about it. Have you been shot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you have? What? When I was 16. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> what? What's up, everyone? Today, I've got an online poker legend with a tale to tell. And his name metaphorically implies tales, so um, it makes it, it fits. Uh, so I thought that he had only won a mere 16 million online, but it turns out it's more like 25 million. But who's counting? Who cares? Right? And online from tournaments. And on top of that, he's had a few swings. He's gone from uh, crushing to getting crushed and facing alcoholism, a little bit of bullying, got in there, and then he came back and won a ton back. And he's back here to tell his tale. He's also co-authored a book, Ape Styles, a.k.a. Jonathan Van Fleet. What's up? I appreciate the intro. You know... We do. We had the dry run the first time. This is actually our second go. I have to. I have to say that. But um, we were vibing out the first time. I mentioned the first time that I uh, that I was a big fan. Actually, that I'd seen you you play some heads up, and that I thought you were a beast. Love the way you think about the game. And you were saying, uh, well, to recap, Ape Styles, aka Jonathan Van Fleet. For all those who are paying attention, was made fun of a bit when he played poker. They were mocking him a little bit, and then he was made fun of a little uh, when he moved from California to Austin. Is that Austin? Is that right? ATX. Yes, sir. All right, he is. He's scaring me with that comment, with that slow response that you got to be nervous for a second because of his pink, uh, pink shoelaces and his 49er jacket. Um, but uh, sounds like he's got the last laugh this time. Pink, uh, I've heard that real men wear pink, so maybe they should uh, have kept that into consideration before they made fun of you. Yeah, you know, I, I think that real men don't ponder too much what real men do. You know, <laughs> but but yeah, I, I agree. I, I told you a story about how I got bullied when I was younger, and uh, the end of that story ends is with me realizing that I'm bigger than them and fighting. And, and actually fighting back with bullies and kind of being a bully myself, to be honest with you, um, where I would look for bullies because I was a big kid. Um, what, <clears throat> that was like a big part of my life and, and a big part of like forming who I became as an adult. And a lot of getting older has been about sort of un un unwiring that aspect of me and not being so aggressive. Um, because uh, when I first uncovered how important that bullying thing was, it was actually with like this this meditating, uh, I mean, this uh, hypnosis session with Elliot Rowe. Um, and I remember at the end of the session, mm -hmm. he said, uh, do you want to let that eight-year-old make decisions for you at the poker table? Because I got I used to get super, super mad when people would uh, three-bet me at the table. And so... <clears throat> I would just say that that bullying experience kind of shaped who I was a lot. Oh, interesting. So you're saying that the the bullying and the 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 um, psychological side effects of that on you, um, or what, like a mini trauma or something, affected uh, how you might respond to people at the poker table if it like the a similar sort of pattern came. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And I had this realization in that moment that. When you're sort of assembling your your emotional responses to things, it, it usually happens when you're young, right? And um, experiences can make your responses like um, appropriate or not, right? And a lot of uh, my life is sort of disassembling and being able to look at the, those emotional responses. And, and to me, the freedom is being able to look at them and then have some some ability to control how I respond. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Well, the more that you, you have to re react to your desires, um, whatever form they take, the more enslaved you are. Um, well, congratulations on getting over that because I do think that 
a lot of playing poker, I mean, that's also true of real life, is somehow getting over your emotional um, issues, uh, for lack of a better word, inefficiencies. Yes. And and to do that is quite a difficult thing to do, um, especially in real life when something's like a deep-rooted trauma versus you know, playing poker. Even in poker, it's not so easy. When you can get all flustered and there's... Uh, you know, a difficult decision on the river. There's certainly a lot of people, I mean, even I get flustered sometimes, uh, that uh, that do not respond particularly well to that. Um, did, uh, did you happen to take these kinds of lessons and apply them elsewhere in poker or in life? I mean, I have that kind of question for you because you've chosen right in some really big spots, some crazy spots, some some bluff raising in spots no one would do spots you know so like um what i what i, I what i want to ask you is sometimes i feel like in the, in some of my bigger spots that clear headed response was blocked by emotion for me and i and i and i believe that that screwed me up mm -hmm. a few times and uh do you have any sort of thing that you tell yourself when you are flustered is there anything that gets you out of that zone place in a big spot um, let me think. So, so, you know, I get, a um, make mistakes all the time. And there's a couple of situations, particularly with junk food, actually. Well, I have like, um, I mean, I can tell you what I do with these sorts of situations is I just try to anchor myself to something that's like not as bad and then just keep lowering and lowering it essentially. But like junk, something, something about sweets and junk food. Like I have like a sweet tooth in poker. I'm trying to think. I, uh, yeah, if I'm really flustered, I mean, a lot of it was just repetition in poker. Mm -hmm. uh, I would sometimes put reminders or prime myself before I'd play to, like, if I knew I had this bad tendency that was a leak of mine, I'd be like, don't hero call or remind myself to not, okay, today I'm not going to hero call against a guy who doesn't bluff that much. I'm not going <laughs> to do it or I'm not going to, like, bluffers or whatever it was against this guy. Um, I would have to like remind myself or like do like a little review before then. Uh, priming does work. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I have from what I understand like psychologically, but I'm not like totally. I, I have a few different mantras like that. Um, that it's funny though. On those days where you were like, "Don't hero call," I'm sure you made some hero calls, <laughs> <laughs> but they were. You was... I mean, it would be like greatly reduced, honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it depends on the player, right? I mean, there was, it was more like, or it'd be an overall leak of sorts that I would have. I have to break that habit. Well, yeah, the thing like is, tiny though, habit, right? So, what it, are the it, mantras it, the is, or things that's that you your do? mantra? You're not looking to hero call. It's like you only make the hero calls when they're exceptional, right? And so, like, um, when, yeah. when, when yeah. they like stand out to you. And so, I think that that's really cool. I also think what you were saying with sweets is that like the way that you kind of um, yeah, like for me, I, I'm way worse than you. Like I'm not like dark chocolate. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to munch a big old chocolate bar or whatever if I'm, you know, but <laughs> like, um, I understand like that you're, you're saying that, uh, the place that you go to when you're like, like to feel good or whatever, where it's kind of irrational is, is, is sweets and food, which obviously I do too. Um, I, I, I think you know, with addiction, I think that's kind of what everyone's doing, right? Everyone, to some degree, is trying to feel good and not feel bad, right? And um, and do mm -hmm. that the the way that they think makes the most sense, right? Um, it just that I think the people that are addicted to things yeah. uh, are just doing it wrong. <laughs> they think that the, uh, for for instance, for me. I think that I was addicted to this a bit idea that I could completely control how I felt. And that's, that's probably why, um, or like the main addiction for me with anything instead of just feeling however you feel. What, what do you mean by that? When I was using a lot of different drugs um, at one point in time when I was addicted to drugs, it was because I always wanted to feel good. Right. I always wanted to feel super sharp, right? And if I didn't, I thought mm -hmm. that there was a drug or pill that could change that. Right? So I was just layering 
all this stuff, just trying to feel even. Lost my mind on that, right? But it was, in a way, it was kind of rational in that I was just trying to feel good. I believe everyone's kind of just trying to feel good. Some people are just, uh, and I think that other people are kind of trying to escape their emotions in all kinds of different ways. Um, oh, sure. And that the main, yeah. I just, I just did it the, the craziest way possible. And, and for me, because I learned the best way for me is to, uh, with, with drugs, especially hard drugs is to stay away. Sure. Yeah. I mean, hard drugs are not I mean, <laughs> drugs. So, <are> bad. <laughs> downside. I'm, for, I'm lucky. I don't have that temptation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, everyone's got their like weaknesses. And so, by the way, I mean, there's all kinds of variations of, uh, coping, is what you're referring to, mm. um, from what I understand. I know a decent amount of psychology, but I'm not like, you know, a super expert. I just read about it a lot, uh, and I recognize my own little mechanisms, mm -hmm. such as um, one example of coping that I recognized was that um, I don't know how much of a difference it makes. Was that uh, when working out? Uh, I mean, I would listen to music. A lot of people listen to music when they're working out mm -hmm. because it's boring. That's a that's a way of coping with the boredom. Yeah. Um, or with the pain, right? I mean, that's a very simple example, but there's other, there's all kinds of different ways. Like people like make excuses and blah, blah, blah. In fact, um, that's one of the things that interested me in this topic of uh, spiritual enlightenment, et cetera, is like literally it's um, looking at things exactly as they are. That's like a really clear way of, uh, or a really big aspect of it, I should say, is uh, simply, uh, being okay with those emotions and processing, 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 processing them accordingly. Um, uh, and so like it, it like has to do a lot with the more subtle variations of, um, interpersonal addictions and things like that. Uh, but, uh, that's, it's more like, yeah, it's a, a whole another conversation. Um, would you like to say some of the things that you did to get over your addictions? Because it, it sounded like you had some friend support. It sounds like you had some mantras. It sounds like you just stayed away totally. I did, but I mean, uh, it must be hard to for... detach yourself from doing it to like staying away totally. Huh? You know, I, I didn't think that you were, I really, I really enjoyed what you were talking about there with being, with being, seeing things as they are and not trying to change them, being interested in them. And that's kind of what I'm talking about a lot of the times is that that gives me some freedom over my emotions and stuff is when I can take a step back and, and be the observer of everything, right? And just watch mm -hmm. without having, without wanting to change things for good or bad, just watching and seeing. Um, I've always been very interested in that too. In fact, mindfulness did help me um, and, and I, I was, I would have even called myself a Buddhist at, at one point in time. I, I went to uh, quite a few retreats, um, two mm -hmm. 10 day silent retreats. And, and I think that that like, um, that did a lot for, for just kind of quieting my brain and giving me a little bit of ability to, to, to step back and, and be in that observer mode, you know, and oh, that cool. helped me with addiction. But like, I'll tell you what. I know that that person is still in me and that, that I'm still an addictive person without a doubt. Yeah. Well, I mean, like everyone's got their, yeah, I think every, I don't know if it's hard to get rid of the, or it'd be, it would, it might be possible to get rid of the, uh, I mean, it would be a harder thing to get rid of the, the tendencies. I mean, everyone's got their tendencies, like just in general of their strengths and weaknesses and that sort of thing. It's like whack-a-mole, you know, like if you're doing good in one area, it's, it's, you, you screw up the other, you know, oh, yeah. it's hard to, to be, if you have like friendship, family, life, exercise, all this, it's hard to, to be, and then like living healthy, like it's, it's hard to get it all right, you know? Oh yeah. Well, there, there's for sure like, uh, what is it? It's, I think the term is called leakage or correlation between, mm -hmm. um, different areas. If, I mean, I've noticed that myself, the more I'd pursue things like pleasure, it seemed like the more I'd be oriented towards that um, and like less oriented towards other things that would like mess with my mind a little bit. Um, whereas it'd be easy to get into momentum, a momentum of like doing productive things over and over. There's like some kind of, 
There's something to do with, uh, I mean, like one one simple example is like even if you do something as simple as making your bed, it, it, it somehow creates, uh, I forget the hormone, but it, it somehow gets you more in the habit of doing think productive things if you just do that simple thing. Um, I guess it's just the way Ooh. that, the, uh, what's the term? You should know this stuff, uh, the way your brain chemistry works. Um, so did you, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you used mindfulness to get over it. I knew that you went to rehab. Oh, um, yeah, I went to rehab like 10 years ago and, uh, at the orchard and in, in, on Bowen Island. Mm-hmm. And for five years, I was like really, really, uh, into recovery. And that was a big part of my life. And I even stayed in Canada, uh, well, without leaving, just so that I could keep that community and have those roots. And, um, you know, I learned a lot during that time period. Uh, <clears throat> it's not really a huge part of my life right now, but that was like, I put a lot, a lot of energy into getting better because, oh man, I got into a pretty bad, I was in a, I was in a pretty bad place before I went to rehab. Um, I've told this story like a thousand times, like almost enough to where I feel a little disconnected from it, but it happened. I, I, I know. <laughs> uh, like when I was in Cabo in like 2013, you could get all these different drugs from the pharmacy there. Mm-hmm. And I was staying up for like 90 hours playing. And Whoa, uh, Stevie crazy. and uh, Pat took, they actually took my computer from me. Really? Because I was just like dumping money. And they were like, listen, I was like, give me my computer back. They were like, listen, I'll give you your computer back if you can tell me what day it is. <laughs> and I got the month wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like, I was really, really gone for a bit. I don't know, I, like, like I said, I was trying to, to you know, <laughs> like be, the, be at that plateau chasing pleasure. And uh, yeah, you know, like I really scared my friends and, they helped me get out of there and helped me get into treatments. They stayed with my mom and, and, um, for, I stayed there for 90 days and really focused on, on making sure that that didn't happen again. Um, cause it, it scared me. Shit. I, I, I've also dumped a shitload of money. Uh, it sucked. You, you might've played me heads up. Shit. <laughs> Impossible. I don't know. Um, well, that that is really intense. Uh, I guess I I just wonder about like the withdrawal symptoms. I guess there just wasn't any drugs in sight. Like one of the things that you're supposed to do, and I know there's a term for this because I've read it, but I don't remember what the term is. But you're supposed to create the situation where it's harder to get your drugs. In my case, I would like, well, I didn't. I never had serious drug problems, but I like would uh, <laughs> I would not put any junk food in my uh, place. I would like uh, not because I would eat it for sure. But uh, I mean, I it would did. think that there's no, no uh, drugs there. But you must have like some serious withdrawal problems, is what I'm thinking. That's why. Well, that's why I went to to treatment is I needed to be fully away, like where I could not get it. I couldn't do it on my own. Um, I, I I couldn't make myself not. So uh, that's why I went to treatment is because I was on a lot of drugs and, and I had tried to, to go cold turkey and it is nasty. Um, either way, actually I went cold turkey and, and it sucked, but I couldn't leave. Um, I, it was not na- like, uh, you can't, the main thing that I was addicted to last time I was in treatment was opiates. And, um, like you actually can't die from an opiate withdrawal, but you just, you kind of wish you were, <laughs> it's bad, you know, and, oh, yeah. and, uh, not a lot of sleep and it, it just like, your insides don't feel very good either. So it's, it's not fun. Um, but then, you know, as you get out of it, you start to feel normal again and start to appreciate that. And that's something that I actually, I think about a lot. Anytime I feel shitty or think I'm in a bad mood, do you know how much, how, what you would give to feel just normal if you got like shot or, (laughs) or if you actually feel bad you know, when you feel sick, what would you do to feel normal? So appreciate normalness, like, like feeling normal like that. Um, I can, so I can see that. That, that was there... kind of what happened with me is that like I started to get a good attitude and treatment and um, felt better and kind of reworked everything. But yeah, go ahead. My bad. 
No, you should speak more. Uh, it's uh, your podcast. <laughs> and um, I mean, I kind of understand. True. I've never gone through that, that exact bad stuff. I've had like some days that were bad. I've never been shot before. You've been shot? No, I've not been shot. I've been, uh, been... I've been hit in the face. I've been really sick. Um, but that's about it. Have you been shot? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you have? What? When I was 16. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. What? Uh, what shit, I didn't there? even I didn't even mean to like like bring that up. That's not even a story that I that I tell that much. Um not not because it's like trauma or anything, just because like I don't really want to be associated with any kind of violence. But um oh. Yeah, when I was 16 I was shot. Okay, do you want to talk about it more? Or I mean, I want to talk <laughs> about it, but it's up yeah, to sure, you. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> this is good for the podcast. Yeah, no doubt. Uh basically um I was drinking and I was with my friends and, and uh, we were at a house that we would all hang out at. And this guy had stolen a pound of, of weed from a friend of mine. And we went and we called up uh, the, the we knew where he was at. And we called him up. And he got on the phone. My name's this. I'm going to shoot your mama. I'm going to shoot your grandma. I'm going to shoot your dad. Like, And if you come over and I was drunk and... This was like a, a bad, see, this is a bad bluff call on, on my end, but <laughs> sometimes <laughs> we went over real. there, <laughs> we went over there with a group of guys. I was ahead of everybody else. He, uh, started blasting. It was, it was a 12 gauge, but it was a, a bird shot. So I got shot, it blasted all over here. My lungs got coll- collapsed. Uh, still, still have pellets in me. Holy shit. Um, <clears throat> but and I got I got to ride in a helicopter, didn't really get to enjoy it, but uh, um, yeah, it was it was it was one of those first big moments in my life where I started being like contemplating things and being like, what are you doing, you know? And, and I did change things after that. Actually, my grades did change after that, and uh, I stopped hanging out with certain people, you know, and, and realized that <clears throat> like that wasn't the life that I wanted to live. It doesn't sound like the great life. Does it not sound like the dream life, <laughs> like confronting people? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I was never like a like a, a super violent person or anything. I, I just hung out with like kind of like the bad kids in high school, you know, <laughs> like um, where we would just party and drink, but it, uh, nothing, nothing too crazy. But like, uh, yeah, like. That, I guess that people are always so blown away by that story, especially outside of Texas. I guess in Texas, it's more normal. <laughs> um, but yeah, actually looking at my mom after that, uh, what it did to her. And um, yeah, I, I, I was not doing well in school. I was getting in a lot of trouble. And after that, I got like A's and honors courses. So it did do something. Well, at least sure. it did something good. I mean, geez, that's... Uh... Uh, some real stuff you're talking about here, like some real life stuff. Uh, somehow the it actually kind of oh, like it, it kind of like wasn't even that bad. It kind of like kind of like up my popularity in high school. Maybe a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not not really. Like I thought it was stupid, but but like it it hurt. It sucked. It was bad. It made me change things. But like it also like I don't really view it as like like trauma or myself as a victim or anything like that like um it was more just like like i got in the way of flying metal that sucked next time somebody says they're gonna shoot you if you go over there don't go over there all right that's good to know a lot that the uh <laughs> well maybe they'll like think to themselves well what if they would have some popularity problems and then no, i'm kidding uh yeah, so stay away from people <laughs> yeah, with guns, get, like, guys. <laughs> That's it. Good message to promote. And hard drugs. Also, stay away from those. Um, I can, uh, yeah, I haven't, uh, I think I'm fortunate not to have that experience. Well, let's talk about some of your upswings because you found poker in college, right? Yar. Yeah. Yeah. Made seventy thousand dollars off of uh, some college kids somehow. I don't know where they like formed a confederation. That didn't happen. Sorry, man. You huh? got that one a little wrong. Uh, oh, whoops. I actually, 
I, I got my ass kicked by my friends. And my friends beat me. And I'm not even sure that I was up on them that much. I well, made 70000 my first year playing online. It's oh, always okay, been online, okay. baby. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes more sense. I was about to say, like... Yeah. Sorry, gonna, bro. Like, but like, that like, much like, I definitely never said that. <laughs> from I mean, I barely games. play with my friends. Once I found online, I was, I was, I was hooked on that. Like, that was way more interesting to me than, than sitting there and, and playing fun poker real slow. Um, I was into tournaments and then I met this guy Chase who really taught me how to um, like the, the different like two plus two and, and pocket fives and I, I got more into the study aspect of the game and that's how I made money um, my first year. Live poker, shit, I'm, I'm probably down like, like lifetime in live poker. Oh, wow. Well. Um, <laughs> It's all about the chase. No. <laughs> um, the glory. <laughs> it's about the glory. It's uh well, online poker is better if you can like, if you can find like some good spots and crush them for a while and make money faster and can stay in your own home and all that. Uh, I will say that 17 million from it's mostly tournaments, right? You play tournament poker, from my understanding. Do we? Do you play much cash? They're twenty five um, million. Excuse me. I, I have it. no like, like the majority of my 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 profit is from tournament poker. Yeah, I mean that's I quite a lot. Heads I, up I, and... I I'm not up that much in in tournaments. I think I'm up like if we're talking about in tournaments, like just around four million or like yeah, right around there. Uh, just um, only four million. So that's not much. Twenty years. I mean, but like, um, you know, some of that was backed. Some of that was blown, you know. I, I ain't. I, I'm not sitting here uh, rolling around in money either, though. You know, um, I don't have all that four million at all. Okay. But uh, technically, I am up that much money um, in MTTs. Oh, congratulations! Was it? Um, how did you? Was there any secrets to your success coming up in the first place? I think I alluded to it, uh, and I think maybe you would agree, too. It has to do with putting a system to it, um, you know, actually, like, studying what I'm doing, um, making mm-hmm. sure that, um, like, I was, I was not doing anything well until I met this guy, Chase, who I saw made a living, had his hours he played, did, got the rig back. He even knew ICM back in, like, 2004, um, and so honestly, Chase went on to big, bigger things, I'm pretty sure, but he, he really sh- showed me how to put a system and be organized about it. And that would, that would be probably why I'm here today. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I remember reading that, um, that you're uh, a fan of like, uh, having, um, a structure for how you're doing things. Is that what you're referring to? Like, uh, like some habits of, uh, what you do when you play or to make sure you're, you're have, having good habits? Is that what you mean? Yeah, basically, like, I think that poker, you can be crazy. Like, I'm a crazy person, right? Like, like I, the kind of person that played those 90-hour sessions or whatever, like, at, at one point. So, like, having, you know, when it comes down to it, though, valuing studying and trying to be systematic when I wasn't on a crazy bender, for the, for the most part, you know, uh, worked out for me. And that's still the way I am about studying, basically. And uh, I try to be that way about bankroll management as well. Like, I would still, if we're talking about long-term success, I would, I would always bet on someone who knows how to manage a bankroll and plays in good games over, like, a, a skilled player. Um, yeah, that makes sense. That's uh, definitely discipline and yeah. things like this can matter more than sheer talent sheer talent by itself can't get you that far i mean there's these days especially there's many people who had tons of talent who were superseded by people who didn't necessarily that worked very hard and that had good discipline i mean like i think i sold her is kind of one of them to be honest he had like a lot of talent but he never studied really he never had good bankroll management and played in lots of bad games i mean he was like really extreme in both directions he was a warrior though he battled that's what i I like that about him um but yes uh 
I was I was a fan of him for sure too, and because I I actually think another reason why I'm around still is because I I always paid attention to to how cash game players were studying the game and looking at the game because mm-hmm. MTT players for the most part uh, weren't <laughs> that much. So I I, I actually hmm. think that converting, um, watching cash game player videos things like that actually helped me in my career. Anyway, with uh, hmm. Uh, it's still dirt, but he should stick to MTTs. You can still, you can still not study and win for sure. Um, I mean, I realized I had to study. I guess I was like, thinking, whoa, like I need to know all these preflop spots and all this like ICM stuff. And, uh, um, but yeah, these days, highest stakes or just beautiful. in general, it's a good idea to study. Huh? It's so unsolved, especially if you get PKOs. Like, like right now, it, it, there's so much to study, and there's like. We know ICM's wrong, but we don't know how wrong it is. So I still think MTTs are like really cool uncharted territory um, where like cash games used to be like, those were the good players in the cash games, but you just have to study one set of solves. Now MTTs playing them perfectly, knowing how to do that, that's that would be hard to do. Um, I mean, I guess the thing is the EV difference in many of the prefault decisions is not very big. And True. I mean, you can, yeah, I mean, it's in a way more complicated if you look at it, like with the absolute number of decisions possible compared to, um, well, if you play deep cash games, it's no longer true, but they don't really exist that much. Like deep cash games are kind of rare, but uh, yeah, there's still potential of sorts. I wouldn't necessarily say the high stakes games are tournaments are like, you know, there's tons of value necessarily. Um, well, what about your upswing? I presume your downswing was because of the, uh, the drug addiction. What was it that contributed to your upswing to your, to the comeback? I mean, if you're playing MTTs that you're going to, you're going to downswing even, even when I, the majority, it's true. the majority of my adult life, I, I actually haven't done drugs at all really. It's because I realized that they don't, they don't work for me. Um, but all right, good. Uh, I've I've had It'll... some downswings. Um, but yeah, like like my huge downswings for the most part were when I was loaded. In fact, when I went to treatment, huh. I uh, did this like I did this uh, chart thing where I was like, my life was good when I wasn't. <laughs> then I started doing shit. My life got bad. But. Uh, yeah, my biggest upswings, I guess, were when I played the 25Ks on GG. Um, like, I, I think I made, like, in a month, like, 2.6 million. and But I only had, oh, wow. like, 25% pretty, of myself. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, then I took a huge piece of no. myself because I was like, free money, baby. I'm going to get yacht money. And then I, I uh, dropped, like, 1.5 back. Um, Whoops. Which made me personally a much bigger loser in those games <laughs> than I was that's a winner. That's so salty. But that's that's super salty. <laughs> Stevie and Elio though got did pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't played the twenty five Ks because I know they're tough. That is why I know what these guys how much they study, and I don't. I have not studied as much as them, and I'm sitting there thinking. I need to study before I like you face didn't... these guys, unless or this game needs to be soft. In these in these top tournament players, if there's like basically, I'm not like primarily a top tournament player. I play the other stuff. You know, we're talking if you're talking about cash games and whatever, that's a different story. So you didn't like study or anything, or it was mostly because of downswings that you like went up and down, and there was no secret to your comeback, or was it just just the nature of the poker or the will of the poker gods? 100 percent actually i take it back i don't want to start anything with 100 percent because i don't want to lose my 100 percent card um but i would say that there has to be some sort of correlation in my life between how i'm living and my my results they're not perfect though right because it's mtts um Mm -hmm. and also if I associated it too much, like, you know, you're going to go through downswings, and I can't just be, like, 
what am I doing wrong in my life? You know, it's like downswings happen, the cards <laughs> happen. Um, but, but I know that if I went back and looked back on my life, um, that my results were way better when I was paying attention to my physical health, um, studying the game, and getting good sleep, you know, obviously. Well, good sleep, by the way, is much more important than people think. Um, the other things matter too, but I don't know. I think it varies by how much they matter. Uh, I feel like I haven't noticed much of a correlation between them. Definitely studying helps, uh, obviously. But uh, one thing about sleep is I read a bit about sleep, and there's all kinds of negative side effects, even if you're like a little bit lacking in sleep. It's like the biggest thing that's necessary. Uh, it affects like everything, which is a little bit frustrating because it's very tempting to like try not to sleep, as uh, I've seen you're aware of. <laughs> um, you're, you, you sleep. Uh, I, I don't like lack too much sleep too much, but I like tried to, to, uh, push it a bit and like sleep only five hours, but like it doesn't really happen. Basically it's, it's very hard to sleep only five hours. It's a rare trait, super rare actually that people can get away with doing that. Oh, I, I kind of do a little bit, but like, um, like my mom, my mom definitely does. And, and she was super high functioning. Like she's, she was a, a executive, but, uh, like I actually don't get the best sleep and it's something that I'm, I'm trying to problem solve a little bit right now because I, I wake up a lot. In fact, I was, I was, I had this, uh, this band, this whoop band or whatever, and I thought I slept fine, and then I put it on, and it told me how, how I wasn't getting good sleep and how I only slept five hours uh, out of the seven or eight hours that I was in bed. And uh, I actually stopped using it because I was like, stop telling me I'm tired. I feel fine. What? <laughs> but, but, well, that doesn't make sense. But at the same time, like I, I uh, need to fix it. Yeah, it's... um. No, I mean, there's lots of, it's easy to leak in that way. And it, and everyone who does leak is not aware. It's in this book called Why You Sleep by uh, this guy. His, name, his first name is Matthew. I forget what his last name is. But the book is called Why Why We Sleep. Um, hmm. So it might be worth checking out. Whoa. Uh, I thought we didn't know, really. We know, um, but we don't really lots... know. Especially we don't know why we dream, right? I um it might talk a bit about that answer. I can't comment too much on dreaming. I'm like curious about it myself because there might be some element of like mysticism to it, even though he specifically is skeptical of that. Although I realize there's an irony in what he said. Oh yeah. One of one of the coolest things I've ever I've I've ever heard about like using dreams for, for learning and, and was uh Talking to Jordan from BBZ, he said that when he was uh, a soc soccer player as a kid, his footwork wasn't good, and he kept he kept getting you know feedback on his footwork. And one night he dreamed all night that he was working on his footwork, and he actually got better and sorted his footwork out in his dream. And like noticeably, uh, the coach said something about it. Um, and you know, <laughs> I think that's actually like. Um, and, and Jordan, he would be doing something like that as a kid, just efficiently using time better, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I thought that was cool. I will say, um, I've had a few dreams that seemed kind of, uh, telling, um, it's the more I, the ones I remember the most seem to have, seem to matter more. Well, we don't have a ton of time. Why don't we talk a bit about, um. I know you host poker. You you co-authored a book and you write and you uh, have. Is it online seminars that you do? I guess online poker seminars, or you teach people online. Yeah, man, I teach at BBZ Poker, and uh, I actually do tw two seminars a week. I love talking poker. I love studying poker. In fact, like the uh, the process of 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 learning. Is, is something that I really like, I'll just, I think I'll always do. My mom was like, when are you going to retire? And I'm like, why well, retire when I have nothing else to learn, you know? So I, I love playing poker and, and, and helping people too, if I can. So 
Um, yeah, that's what I do. I have a pretty good life. And, uh, you know, it's cool that I get paid to talk about a game that I love to talk about. Oh, yeah, it's amazing that uh, if you can find what you love to do that you don't want to quit is, is perfect. And if you can help people in the meantime make a positive difference, that sounds like a great situation. And I don't have the uh, other kinds of problems as well. And to not have those, excuse me. No doubt. You know, as much as I love poker, like I, 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 I can, like I'm still kind of intermediate at teaching, and so I'm always looking for new ways to to try to um, teach and 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 help facilitate like growth. And I think that that um, I think poker can be that. Uh, I think that. For me, the, the the challenge, like as a person with poker, it has been, has always been to view when things don't go my way as opportunities to learn and not beat myself up, you know. And I think, mm -hmm. um, yeah, poker really does teach you how to like you have to be okay with with whatever life throws at you. And I think that that like like um, that would be one of those meta lessons. What 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 would be another one of those sort of like poker meta lessons? Well, one lesson, one lesson, uh, one meta lesson would be humility, for example. Um, like if you think you're very good at poker, it's like quite a negative uh, or you think you're on top of the world sort of situation. It's quite actually a precarious situation. This doesn't only, only apply from poker. And poker is really, really good at humbling. Um, and the best case scenario <laughs> is that you're right, right? So, yeah, the best case scenario is that you're right. And all the other situations are bad. <laughs> <laughs> if you think that you're on top of yeah. the world um, and there's all kinds of ways in which you learn that you're not. And that's a, it, it keeps you grounded, which is very important in life. And uh, it can totally be implied that, in other to ways. Too. I thought I'd do everything. Oh, keep going. I'm sorry. Yep. Oh. Yeah. That's the dangerous thing. If you think you know everything, that's where you get screwed. It's uh, I mean, it's sometimes, sometimes okay, of course, but uh when there's more stuff out there and there's, there's lots of competition and volume, then you can, you might have a problem. Um, now we got to wrap things up. Uh, one last question for you. What's the name of your autobiography? The name of my autobiography. I'm not that good at naming books. My book is called winning poker tournaments one hand at a time. I should have known. <laughs> like, oh yeah. yeah. Um, no, uh, for me, it's just, it's all about love, man. Like, and, and I love, for me, winning at life is about loving myself, loving others, having a good time. And so the, the title of my book would just be, it's all about love. All right. That's the follow up book, potentially maybe a book in the future. It's all about yeah. love by also, uh, Jonathan just like, Van Fleet. <laughs> You know what? Keep the up. other thing is just like making big ass mistakes, man, doing shit big um, and like learning from them. <clears throat> All right. I'm a fan Go of big stuff, course. big mistakes, big stuff. All right. Well, thank you for your time, Jonathan. Um, I got to go. Thank you, my man. 